Good morning. Good morning. We are so glad you have joined us here in person and online for Sunday worship. I'm Janet Ernst. We always like to start our worship service with a chance to say hi to our neighbor. So given our July weather, please greet your neighbor and ask, what's your favorite summertime meal? Yeah, how about you? Hot dogs. I love hot dogs. <laughs> what, any particular kind? No. Any kind. Any kind. Any kind of hot dogs is good. <laughs> A big thank you to you all for supporting our St. David's Food Pantry. This week we fed 150 families. It's thanks to your generosity. And if you'd like to volunteer in the pantry, it's open Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 9 a.m. till 12 noon. You can contact the front office if you'd like to pitch in. During today's service, we will be marking life celebrations of those in our parish. So if you had a birthday, anniversary, job promotion, retirement, or other significant milestone in July, it's my new car count. You'll be invited to come forward later in our service and share your news with your parish family. For our online friends, you can find this morning's bulletin by following the link in the chat box. And please sign our online guest book. It's also in the chat box. Also, please pray with us. Is there someone or something we can pray with you about? We invite you to submit a prayer request via the chat box. Once again, welcome to our parish family. We're delighted to have you and excited for what has, God has planned for us.
without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy. Increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal, that we lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Mm -hmm. Our first reading is from the Hebrew Scriptures and the second book of Samuel, where we hear of King David's adultery with Bathsheba and murder of Uriah. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliab, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived and sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house. David said to Uriah, you have just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah remain in booths. And my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go down to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live, and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord but he did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him so he may be struck down and die. May a word dwell in us. And may our spirit is here Psalm 14. Lord, let thy word be my rule. In it may I rejoice. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. All are corrupt and commit abominable acts. There is none who does any good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon us all to see if there is anyone who is wise, if there is one who seeks after God. Lord, let thy word be my rule. In it may I rejoice. Everyone has proved faithless. All alike have turned bad. There is none who does good. No, not one. Have they no knowledge, all these evildoers, who eat up my people like bread and do not call upon the Lord? Let thy word be my rule. In it may I rejoice. See how they tremble with fear, because God is in the company of the righteous. 
Their aim is to confound the plans of the afflicted, but the Lord is their refuge. Lord, let thy word be my rule, in it may I rejoice. Oh, that Israel's deliverance would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, Jacob will rejoice and Israel be glad. Lord, let thy word be my rule, in it may I rejoice. Our second lesson is from the Christian scriptures in St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, where he prays that he would have strength and power to comprehend God's love. I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power from his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly for more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May your word dwell in us. And bear much fruit to your glory. Seated. 
So also the fish, as much as they wanted, when they were satisfied, he told the disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. They got into a boat and started across the sea to the river. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea, coming near the boat, they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I, not be afraid. Then they wanted to take it into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to you, Lord Christ. Please join me as we pray our centering prayer. Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, Son, Son of God, may your will be done through me. Please be seated. Spread your desired sauce on the bun. Place a piece of fried fish. Then add a slice of cheese on top. Throw a bit of shredded lettuce in the mix. The heat from the fish will melt the cheese. Sound familiar? Like a McDonald's fish sandwich. Is this a cooking lesson? You remember, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? This morning, Jesus is asking us the same question. Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test Philip, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, six months wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get even a little. The feeding of the 5,000, this is one of the few miracles you'll find in all four gospels. Every gospel has a story about Jesus feeding 5,000. This is the Bible's way of letting us know that we cannot study or read without knowing that the ministry of Jesus was not just to save souls, but to feed hungry bellies. And as you read this miracle of 5,000 being fed with five loaves and two fish, this is not just a miracle, but it's also a mandate on every generation that we are to feed those who are hungry. We have heard this miracle, the story about feeding the 5,000 in Sunday school. We've heard about it in sermons. In each of the four Gospels, we read a different point of view, telling us how, God, uh, how Jesus got in the predicament he got in, with such a large crowd gathering and the need to feed them. If you read about it in John, Jesus has been performing many miracles and needed a break, but this crowd was following him and he could not ignore them. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus gave his disciples the authority to minister. The disciples return exhausted and Jesus says, let's take a break. In Matthew, John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, has been executed and Jesus wants to get away to have private time to mourn. Mark brings the story together. According to Mark, the disciples are exhausted after ministry. What we would describe as preaching, making pastoral visits, and performing miracles. John the Baptist has been executed and Jesus, also exhausted, encourages the disciples to take a break. Jesus gathers the disciples and suggests they take a sunset cruise across the Sea of Galilee and get away from these church folk. Because every now and then, church folk can get on your last nerves. <laughs> Friends, please don't look at anyone. You know that's not being Christian. 
Jesus says to his disciples, let's get away. The Bible says the people run along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, following the boat. They won't leave Jesus alone. When Jesus sees them, he's not angry. He recognizes they are sheep without a shepherd. So he begins to teach them about the kingdom of God. As he is teaching the crowd, the disciples quietly tell him, we have a couple of problems. One, it's getting late. Second, the people are hungry. To be more accurate, the people are hangry. They are so hungry, they're getting angry. Imagine a crowd of church folk who are hangry. That could be a problem. The third problem is this. The Bible says they are in the wilderness. What is the wilderness? The wilderness, according to the online Oxford Dictionary, is a dangerous and uncultivated region, similar to a forest or desert. No one lives there except wild animals. It could be land or territory protected by the government. In our context, I believe it's a semi-arid area, a desolate area where nobody lives. The people who kept following Jesus and his disciples find themselves in a place where there is no food. There are no supermarkets, no Meyer, no Kroger, no Plum Market, no Whole Foods, and there are no convenient stores nearby. None of this feels like the bakers does it. Where do we see church folk on Sundays after church? There is no Cracker Barrel, no Red Lobster, nowhere to get something to eat. They are in the wilderness. The wilderness is where food security is a horrible reality. Wilderness is where public schools are not funded because they are in ethnic and urban communities. Wilderness is where sex trafficking is not policed because the prostitutes are a different color from the officers. Wilderness is where the playing field is not level. The wilderness is where civil rights are not protected. The wilderness is where statistics and stereotypes kill dreams before they are even dreamt. The wilderness is where fentanyl is laced in recreation drugs. The wilderness is where Justice is not blind, but color conscious. We see a wilderness for several people in our first reading for today. David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down. Where is God in all this? David abuses his position and power to take possession of another man's wife. Bathsheba was in a wilderness. Uriah was in a wilderness. The wilderness is something we all know about. You know you're in the wilderness when you go to sleep to one mass shooting and wake up to another. You know you're in a wilderness when you have a Congress that is efficient enough to change your voting district and they can't get together to enact gun reform. The wilderness is finding yourself in the middle of a COVID-19 pandemic. The wilderness is where historical black colleges shut down from lack of funding, but prisons are making money filled with black and brown bodies. We are in a wilderness. You know you're in, you're in a wilderness when you tried to convince me that the greatest threat to our freedom is an immigrant, knowing immigrants built this country. When the FBI has said the greatest threat right now is the Christian nationalist movement. We're in a wilderness when you hear lawmakers make laws restricting women's reproductive rights. Yes, we're in a wilderness. We're in a wilderness when some of us support laws with language about who can love and who can legally get married. We are in the midst of a wilderness. The wilderness is like places that have been left behind. A politician's words went viral on social media recently with, look out for your neighbor, don't be weird. The wilderness is when people take their desires too far, so far that it hurts others. So far their actions take everything away from others. 
where in the midst of wilderness, when the playing field is not level, when the playing field looks like a hot mess. That is where we find ourselves. And now our gospel reading for today says, Jesus looked up and saw a crowd coming towards him. Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? They are in a wilderness. Our public schools are in a wilderness when our children have to practice active shooter drills. Our health care that doesn't deliver when we need it is a wilderness for patients, their families, and the health care workers. Our jobs find us in a wilderness. Friends, it's tough out there. When the disciples find themselves in a boat with rough seas, they are in a wilderness. They were terrified when they saw Jesus walking on water towards them in the storm. Jesus walking on water shows he is not bound by the laws of nature. He commands nature. He reassures the disciples with the words, it is I, do not be afraid. At the moment, Jesus' presence brought peace. The storm ends, the waters are calm, and the disciples immediately reach their destination. This demonstrates how Jesus' presence, calling on him in prayer, brings immediate relief and deliverance from fear, life's storms, and trouble. So what do you do if you find yourself in a wilderness? What do you do? We have just read about what the disciples did when they found themselves in a wilderness. They told Jesus. So what do we do? Those of us who are under attack from womb to tomb, if I ever find myself in, in, in a wilderness, if I ever find myself in what seems like an impossible situation, this is what I would do. Remember what our second reading says. I will bow my knees before the Lord and pray to him, who by the power at work within me is able to accomplish abundantly more than all I can ask or imagine. We have that power within us. I will find a quiet place, lift up my hands and pray to God, starting with, Lord, it is me, it is me here in this wilderness. I know that when I pray to the Lord, my faith assures me that the Lord will make a way. Because the idea of who we should be, the society we should live in, and the world our children will live in is in our hands. Our commandment through this gospel is not just to make more disciples. Our, com our commandment is not to fill churches. Our commandment is not to shout hallelujah or amen at the right time. We are encouraged to find the answer within ourselves when we pray. Howard Thurman said it best. The power of prayer is directly connected to you willing to be part of God's answer. The power of prayer comes at the end when we say, now Lord, use me, here's my voice, here are my hands. We are commanded to take care of those in the wilderness. The disciples came to Jesus saying, we have a problem, we don't have enough. Jesus' response was, what you got? Jesus is saying through his response that the answer to our prayer is us. We are the answer to our prayer. You feed my people. You see, that response from Jesus was not just for the disciples. It's a response impressed on every generation of Christians that follow. In this gospel, whenever the Lord is calling on us to engage in social justice for those who need advocacy, there are two responses. On one hand, the disciples, and on the other hand, the little boy. Allow me, if you will, for the next hour of this sermon, <laughs> allow me to compare disciple and the little boy. You may be shocked to know that the disciples are not who we should follow. The hero of the story is the little boy. And Jesus says, give the people nourishment, give them something to eat. The little boy had the solution. He had five loaves and two fish. Jesus is also telling us, give food to the people who need nourishment. The gospel reading is asking us to advocate for those who don't have a voice. We are asked to find the way for those who are lost. We are asked to provide for those who have less than. We are asked to make sure everyone who is eligible to vote
can vote freely and without fear. We are asked to give medicine to those who need healing. We're asked to create community for all mankind, to create heaven right here on earth. Not only did Jesus feed the people, the miracle of having more loaves of fish and bread, enough for 5,000 out of the meager provisions from a boy who had five loaves and two fish, and the boy who brought the food along with everyone else observed the miracle of abundance and generosity provided by Jesus, performed by Jesus. The food provided was enough for everyone to be full, and there were baskets of leftovers. The people will tell the story, and the little boy will tell others what he saw over and over again to another generation. Imagine 8.3 million Michiganders offering a loaf of bread each, and another 3.3 million Michiganders offering a fish each. In Jesus' hands, that would feed all 8.3 billion people in the world. Just like the little boy's meager offering of five loaves and two fish fed 5,000 people. This modern day parable reminds us that our individual con con contributions, no matter how small they may seem, can become part of something much greater to a higher purpose. May we be inspired to share our own loaves and fish with the world, trusting in the miraculous power of multiplication and the abundance of God's provision. As we experience this new week, trusting God as our protector, let us pray for an increase in his mercy upon us as he guides us so we may faithfully pass through things that are of this world and not lose sight of the things that are eternal. We believe in God, whose love is the source of all life and the desire of our lives, whose love was given a human face in Jesus of Nazareth, whose love was crucified by the evil that wants to enslave us all, and whose love defeating even death is our glorious promise of freedom. Therefore, though we are sometimes fearful and doubting, we trust in God. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we commit ourselves in the service of others to seek justice, to live in peace, to care for the earth, and to share the common wealth of God's goodness, to live in the freedom of forgiveness and in the power of the Spirit of love. And in the name of the Lord, to see the church, the glory of God, and the glory of God. Governor of Michigan, 
and Karen Sliver, Mayor of Southfield. Let us pray to the Lord. Oh, 
and you may be seated as we mark our life celebrations, which we do at the end of each month of the year. And if you had a birthday, anniversary, any kind of milestone in July, I invite you to come forward and celebrate that with your parish family. Uh, many of you may uh, have uh, started a new job, you may have moved out of an apartment, you may have some sort of milestone, you got to get replaced. Uh, you got something that has changed, you got a new car, and uh, your church is a place where you can share that. You may have some great news that you want to share with somebody, and we want to make sure that you get your audience here. And so, you got a celebration in August. Come forward, and Julie's going to be uh, July, rather. Right? In July, Julie's got a basket here because some of you guys come with a lot of money, and we want to make sure we can take it. How are you at? Uh, you got a birthday this July? I'm sorry, you and your daughter. Okay, great. You're not giving away any numbers. 66. Yeah, get your kicks on the 66. All right, how about you, my young lady? Your younger son's anniversary. How many years for him? 26 years. Married here at St. David's, yes, and his granddaughter. How old? 18, okay. Not the same family. No, no, okay. How about you, Ray? Oh, John's 32. Wow. Wow, you guys are 35. Wow. <laughs> Ellen, how about you? Hard at least for last month. She's picking up her arrears here. And so what, what happened then in June? It was your birthday, which is why you weren't here. Yes, on a cruise for her 65th birthday. That's nice. And today is up. Five years since Sister Pam, so we're rooting for Pam. How about you, Francois? Oh, my son, Nicholas. Oh, Nicholas, yeah. 33. 33. And your anniversary on Friday. How many years will it be? 38. Oh, two days will be 38th anniversary, folks. 38 years, 37. Congratulations, that's terrific. 
How about you, Richard? Uh, my second oldest son, birthday, July 11th, anniversary of my father. Second my oldest son, father. anniversary of your father's death, and? And my uncle. And your uncle, okay. Father. All together. <laughs> my goodness, congregation, ask you please to stand and let us pray for our brothers and sisters who have had quite a month in the month of July. Uh, friends, let us pray. Lord Jesus, our hearts and our lives are in your hands, and we give you great thanks for the milestones you've given us. Uh, we pray, Lord, that the year ahead would be one of great health and safety, and we pray, Lord, that as you unfold new things before us, we would accept those as, Lord, ways in which we might go closer to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, bless your people. Amen. Amen. And may the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Miller, one of your St. David's Vestry members, and thanks so much for being here. And if you're good, I just might have a joke for you. Following our worship this morning, we invite you to join us for a cup of coffee and refreshments in the parish hall. Please come and catch up with your friends or meet somebody new. And if you're interested in reading the Bible, we have a Bible study group that meets each Sunday at 9 a.m. in the conference room. We're moving through the two testaments in parallel fashion this year. Come early next Sunday and join us. All are welcome. Father Chris, do, do you know where Solomon's Temple was located? Where Solomon's Temple was located? I, I could guess. I mean, I would guess it would be in Jerusalem. Well, it, the side of his head. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Do you want to learn more you about You know, nine Solomon? years of seminary and it goes down to two. Do you want to learn more about welcoming neighbors into our community? We're planning several Lunch and Learn events this summer, and you're invited. Join us this Wednesday, July 31st, at 11.30 a.m. in the conference room. We'll be studying a presentation called Evangelism with Integrity by an Episcopal priest in Missouri. Bring your enthusiasm and your lunch. Sign up at the Ministry Hub in the atrium. Our next gun disposal event is next Sunday at Nativity Episcopal Church in Bluefield. It's from 9 to 1, and if you'd like to volunteer registering donors or even chopping up unwanted guns, you are all welcome. Please see Father Chris or our seminarian Felicity Thompson for details. And the following day, please join us for our outdoor worship service um, at 10 o'clock out in the back on the lawn. Finally, we hope you'll stay connected with us all week. If you're joining us online, please head to the St. David's website to sign our virtual guest book or follow the link if it's been put in the chat box. For those of you with a bulletin, you can scan the QR code on the back cover to sign our guest book. Also, you can subscribe to our podcast, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube channels. And if you're new with us, stop by the Ministry Hub in the atrium we want to give you a special gift and welcome you to our family. God bless you. And thank you, Mary, very much. For, uh, for, we're going to put a tip jar out for next time. We're going to put jokes. So now our offertory time. Those of you who are joining us online, do go ahead and uh, go to our St. David's website and click on the donate button. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, your uh, offertory, your offerings, we do the best we can with them. 
it's because of your presence here and the ways that you contribute that we are able to feed all those people that get fed, to uh, fill our altar with the fruits of uh, hope and hope in safer community, and to let us walk in love as Christ loved us. He gave himself for us and offered the sacrifice to God.
Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Seek them in remembrance of Christ died for you. Be them in your hearts by faith and your thanks.
go out into the world. Seek God and the wisdom of God. Hide yourself from the corruptions of power and adulation. Entrust whatever you have to Christ, for with him there will always be more than enough. And may God strengthen you in your inner being. May Christ Jesus dwell in your hearts through faith. And may the Holy Spirit plant your roots deeply in the abundant richness 